Good morning and welcome to our Good Friday service. We are glad that uh, you've joined us and uh, we're uh, happy that we're able to bring this service to you this morning. And so uh, we are going to begin with a song, Glory to His Name, when we think of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and all that he accomplished. We praise the Lord for that. And of course, it is to his glory that he uh, finished the work on Calvary. So let's begin. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. If you have our blue hymn book, it's number 2. Glory to his name, verses 1, 3, and 4. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where from cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to My heart was the blood of my glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory Praise the Lord to be able to sing that. Well, at this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Pooley. He's joined us uh, virtually, so I'm going to ask him if he would uh, lead us in a word of prayer. And I might have lost him, so if you give me a moment, we'll phone him back. Hey, Google, call 506-227-6857. Making an audio call to 506-227-6855 on Duo. So we will uh, try this again and uh, get Pastor Pooley on with us. And there he Good is. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> so this is the I'm here. This is the fun of being live as we make adjustments as we go. All right, Pastor Pooley, would you uh, lead us in a word of prayer? And uh, then we will start. Well, Good Friday. And uh, of course, we know that it's Good Friday because of what Christ did for us on Calvary. And so let's have a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds for uh, the service this morning and what the Lord would have for us in his word today. Father, we are thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful for what he has done for us on Calvary, how he died in our place, how he took the penalty for our sins. And, Father, that he uh, not only died and was buried, but that he rose again. And we are thankful for that as we look forward to Resurrection Sunday. But as we continue on today and focus on the cross and what took place there, Father, we pray that it wouldn't be just a time that we would uh, come and, and think about what was done there and, and we are thankful for what happened there but Father we pray that as we focus on the cross today that we would that we would be changed that we would uh, consider what was done for us and uh, that we would 
just uh, determined in our hearts to give him our best each day in service for him. We pray now that as we continue on this morning, pray that you would bless this time, pray that you would meet with us in a special way today, even as we are joining in virtually and not able to meet face to face with one another. We just pray that uh, we, you would encourage each one, that you would bless, and that all that takes place would bring honor and glory to you, and that we would see Jesus, that he'd be high and lifted up today. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have some uh, passages of Scripture that we're going to read today. So uh, we are going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark. So Mark chapter 15. And trust that those that are following along have their Bibles there with them. So if you would turn to, to Mark chapter 15. And so we will read the first five verses. And then we will uh, pick up later with some more verses than Mark 15. But Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 1. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus, and carried him away, and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And we uh, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning, and we look forward to uh, continuing through this passage. And so I believe now we have a, we are going to sing another hymn. And actually, brother, read right up to verse 15 for me, please. Okay, well, we'll continue on then. And so uh, we'll pick up in verse 7. It says, and there was one named Barabbas which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For ye knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered, and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. All right, if you'll turn in your hymn books to number 15. Number 15. We are going to sing, Lead Me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Yeah. 
to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget the Samani. Lest I forget thy agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee. Even Thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget Soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is, being interpreted, the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. Let us sing uh, in your hymn books, number 29, At the Cross. Number 29. Alas, and did my Savior bleed Crucified him, 
They parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on his right hand, and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest, buildest it in three days, save thyself, and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and gave up the ghost. Amen. Let us take our hymn books one more time. And we are going to turn to number 27, a familiar hymn, very appropriate to the occasion, and that is the Old Rugged Cross. And of course it was upon an old rugged cross that the Lord Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross with the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll change. Despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Exchange 
it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old sing along with those. Thank you, Pastor Pooley, for reading our scripture this morning. And we will be uh, focusing our attention over in a parallel passage in the book of John, trying to focus today uh, on, of course, that final day in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, that final day in his ministry. And I want you to turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. <clears throat> and we're going to begin in verse 1. There's three things that I want to uh, focus on as we spend our time in the passage this morning. But he says here in John chapter 19, verse 1, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered them, We have a law, and by our law we ought to die. He ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? And Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto thee hath the greater sin. In this uh, first part of this passage, what I want to draw your attention to, when we think of those final hours of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has been scourged, he has been falsely accused, he, uh, of course, was betrayed by one of his own, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, would betray him, and of course, uh, all these things are taking place, and now it's coming down to those uh, the final hours will he, he will be taken, and of course, he will be uh, scourged, beaten, and then uh, spit upon, mocked, and then put upon the cross of Calvary. But the uh, first of the three things that I wanted to draw your attention to in this passage is, even regardless of all that Jesus is going through here, first thing we see is a demonstration of divine control. And Jesus makes that clear in that passage. Pilate says unto him, uh, Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee? Pontius Pilate has uh, given uh, uh, or attempted to give him the opportunity to uh, defend himself. Pilate believed that Jesus was innocent. 
And of course, as Jesus did not say anything, and Pilate responds by saying, well, basically, you know, here's your opportunity for a defense. It is me who's going to make that decision whether you will live or die. And what Jesus makes clear here is that it was not Pilate's power in his power to be able to do that. But as Jesus says, thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. We see an exercise and a demonstration of divine control here. Divine control in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in that he is going through this, these events, going through this situation, fulfilling God's plan for his Son. We also recognize, you know, God's, God the Father's uh, role in this as God has made this happen. God's allowed this. God has given Pilate the authority. Pilate could not do anything apart from God. That's not to say Pilate was a man of God or a, a believer, but the thing is, is all the situation was coming to be because it was within God's power. You see, when we look to the cross, we look to these events, we see that Jesus was there, first of all, because of God's people. He was there because when God put Adam and our, uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned against God. And because of that, sin is passed upon all men, and all are guilty of sin. That's something we can't get away from. Something that's passed down on to each and every one of us. The scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's for that reason, it's for sinners, that Jesus was there about to be uh, sent to the cross of Calvary, about to be crucified. Look at Matthew chapter 26. I'll put my marker in there. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 26. And turn to verse 57. It says, And they that laid a hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses, and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answers thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses, uh, what is it these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need we have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. And then said they, Spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? You know, these individuals, it was because of their hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ. It was because of, you have the Pharisees, you have the scribes, you have the, the uh, Sanhedrin, those that were there of the day that were upset with Jesus because he didn't come and set up the kingdom as they hoped that he might. And so therefore they denied that he was the Messiah. They denied that he uh, could even be the Son of God. And so it was for their reason that they wanted to have him put to death and have him crucified. Jesus was there because of God's people. He's there because of all of us. Because like these individuals, even though we were not present, it was because of uh, the sins of the whole world 
that Jesus had to go through this. We're looking at a demonstration of divine control. Pilate didn't have the power. He had the power to make the decision, but that power had been given to him by God himself. Jesus was there because of God's people. Jesus was there because of God's power. Look at Romans. Turn over to the book of Romans. Pilate, of course, played a significant role in the situation, and he was the one that was given the authority to make the final decision. Uh, even, I believe, deep down, Pilate even believed that, truly believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was innocent in this situation. In, in fact, in the passage, he says he could not find fault with them. And yet, Pilate is torn between uh, letting Jesus go because he believed he was innocent. He was torn between his conscience, but he was also torn between uh, the, the leaders that we just talked about because they cried out to Pilate and said, uh, you know, who are you going to be a friend of? You let this Jesus go, and you're an enemy of Rome. And so Pilate was struggling between his conscience, and he was struggling between that and, of course, uh, the position that uh, he had and the relationship he had with the, the Roman government. And yet we recognize, look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And so Jesus makes it clear in the passage, uh, really confirming what Paul would later write to the Romans, that the power that Pilate had was not his own, but it was granted to him of God. And so we see that Jesus was there because of God's people. Jesus was there because of God's power. And then thirdly, Jesus was there because of God's plan. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And verse 23, start in verse 22, it says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And so... Uh, Luke here in the book of Acts makes it clear that, you know, what just happened, Jesus being crucified and all the events leading up to it, was all by God's design, as he says there, by the determinate counsel and foreign knowledge of God. You know, from the fall in the Garden of Eden, God knew that his son was going to be the one to pay the price. Look at First uh, John we're going to go to 1st John. First John chapter 2 and verse 2 it says, And he is the propitiation or substitution for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He was there because of God's plan. It was God's plan that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to be the perfect substitute for us. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. And verse 10, it says, Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, what a wonderful thing it is to know, as horrendous as we think of the events that took place there, but this was according to God's plan, and God fulfilled that. Romans chapter 3. Back to Romans chapter 3. In verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He makes it clear here, the Apostle Paul, that as he says there in verse 25, whom God has set forth. You know, this was, it, it's already happened from Paul's perspective, but it already had been previous, previously planned by God himself. And so Jesus was there because of God's the sinfulness of God's people. Jesus was there because of God's power. And Jesus was there because of God's plan. A real, as we go back to John chapter 19, a real demonstration of divine control here. None of these events were by accident. None of these events uh, came by surprise upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Even he knew it was going, in fact, if you read before this, you see how Jesus was even preparing his disciples that he, these events were going to unfold and he would have to go through uh, these final hours of his life. And so we see a demonstration of divine control. Let's keep reading down through the passage here. It says, And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one, uh, one on another side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was re written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And then the soldiers when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said, Therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. You know, you think of these events that are playing out here, just even from this account and, of course, the parallel account that Pastor Pooley read for us, and it is difficult for us to even kind of imagine what Jesus was going through. You know, falsely accused and falsely, uh, falsely crucified and, 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 and all that is entailed here in the accounts, and yet... Thinking about, you know, even understand that Jesus uh, was 100% man. He felt the pain of the beatings and of the scourging. He felt uh, the pain of the, uh, the crown being crushed upon his head. 
You know, all that Jesus felt very much. I mean, he was tired. In fact, he uh, could hardly carry the cross. And of course, they, they uh, engaged a Simon to come and, and assist him and take the cross for him. So we recognize, you know, Jesus physically was uh, going through a, a very difficult time, as we can imagine, because he was 100% in the flesh. However, we also see a demonstration of divine compassion here in the passage. That's our second major point as we look at the passage. As we see here, amidst everything that Jesus is going through, and all that, it's, that he's feeling, all that he's suffering, he still demonstrates divine compassion, particularly upon his mother here. He says, when he saw his mother, he saith unto his mother woman, behold thy son. You know, don't forget, Jesus is uh, a compassionate Lord. Our God is a compassionate God, and our God, uh, who was manifested in the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, was a compassionate God. And aren't we grateful for that compassion? Even in the midst of his greatest suffering, he would take time out to look after his mother. And it's no surprise. Look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. It says in verse 2, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ here, he says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we, deceived, uh, we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. We recognize from uh, Isaiah 53, particularly verse 3, when it says that he was rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You know, Jesus understood grief. He understood sadness. He understood, he, he had compassion. And that's the way he's being described here in Isaiah 53. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And in Matthew chapter 23, we see another demonstration of the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew 23, and verse 37, he says here in verse 37, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know, as, as Jesus made his way back into Jerusalem, it tells us that, uh, you know, he wept over Jerusalem. He wept over the fact that they had hardened their hearts against God. He'd wept over the fact that they had given in to sin and that his heavenly Father would have to judge them for that. It was a desire of the Lord Jesus Christ is that they would just turn their hearts to him. We think of the passage um, just before um, Jesus would go to his death. Or, um, he goes and uh, we learn of his brother Lazarus or his uh, friend Lazarus is uh, very sick. And of course they send word to Jesus 
And Jesus, it says he tarries another four days, and when he finally gets there to Bethany, he, he finds out that Lazarus is already dead. And, you know, in that passage is one of the shortest verses in the Bible, they say. It says that Jesus wept. And we recognize the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't, he doesn't weep. He, he, he weeps for the loss of his friend Lazarus, but he doesn't weep for Lazarus because Jesus knows that he's about to call him forth out of the tomb. He knows what miracle he's about to perform. However, he does weep for his friends. He weeps for Mary and Martha and all those that are gathered together there and who are lamenting and, and anguished over the death of a brother and a friend. And we see Jesus' compassion as he weeps for them. You know, Jesus weeps for those that are unsaved. And his desire is that all would come to the salvation of the Lord. So as we look at John here, we see a demonstration of the divine compassion. And then number three, if we keep reading on the next couple of verses there, it says, after this in verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all things are now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst, and now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. We see, number three, a demonstration of divine completion. Jesus went to the cross of Calvary to pay for the sins of the whole world, knowing full well what he was going to go, to go through and what he was going to face, and Jesus did it anyway and completed it perfectly. And when we come to that final passage, when he cries out, it is finished, and it says he bowed his head, he gave up the ghost. They did not take his life from him. Oh, they tried with the beatings and the scourging, but it was at the right moment when Jesus knew that he had accomplished what his father sent him to do, that Jesus chose to give up his life. Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We have here, as he is nearing the end of his ministry, he has just spent the final meal that he would have with his disciples. And it says in verse 39, And he came out and went in as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And again, a demonstration of knowing full well of what laid ahead for him, and yet Jesus' cry and his desire was, Father, I am ready to do thy will, regardless of what it meant for the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to do the work of his Father. He came to follow his Father's plan that we might have eternal life. And we see a demonstration here of divine completion. We recognize that, you know what? God is going to finish all his plans for us. You look through the scriptures, you see some wonderful promises. Promises that have been fulfilled. Promises that are yet to be fulfilled. And you know what? we can count on the fact that God is going to fulfill those. We see God's plan overall for mankind. And God is going to finish that plan. And he will complete it perfectly. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, 
and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You know, we're kind of in that time right now, aren't we? There are those that are saying, oh, you know, the Bible talked about this coming of the Lord Jesus. You know, when is it going to happen? Nothing's changed since the creation. So what makes you think it's going to happen now? That's what he's saying in this passage here. Look at verse 5. It says, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was being overflowed with water perished. Talking about, of course, the flood there. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, we're living in a time of uh, God's love. We're living in a time of uh, God's uh, long-suffering, giving us that opportunity to turn our hearts away from the world and to turn our hearts unto the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might repent and turn back unto him. But look at verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the, coming, uh, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless." an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you you know this tells of us that the fact that God has a plan there's still things to be fulfilled and guess what they are going to uh, play out just as Peter outlines in here and but God has a finish for that and that is He's going to cleanse the world from unrighteousness, and he's creating a new heavens and a new earth. And that's a promise that God has made, and God will fulfill that completely. As we think of Jesus going to the cross of Calvary, we think of his suffering and his crucifixion, all that so that we, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, through the, as he says there, through, through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, that we might be able to be partakers of that. Now, I trust as you um, spend Good Friday, it, it, it's an opportunity for us to uh, turn our attention to the Lord. And so I pray today that you will think of these things. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider what happened on that day that Jesus went to the cross at Calvary. Demonstration of divine control. God is still in control. Demonstration of divine compassion. He sent his son to die for the sins of the whole world that we might have eternal life. Demonstration of divine completion. God will fulfill what he's promised. I trust that you know the Lord is your Savior. If you don't, then it's, it's not too late yet. If I'm still preaching, it's not too late to ask the Lord Jesus Christ as a, to be his Savior. And so find someone that you know that knows the Lord that is a faithful servant of God and ask them to show you how you might have this wonderful salvation. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time this morning and for spending this Good Friday day together. And Lord, we just are grateful for the opportunity to be able to draw our attention to the scriptures to see what the Word of God tells us about uh, the works that Jesus did, and the things that were fulfilled on the cross at Calvary. Lord, we thank you that you are in control. We thank you for your compassion that you have towards us and for your long-suffering. Lord, we thank you that you fulfill your promises. So, Lord, 
We pray now that you'll be with us throughout the day, work in our hearts, draw us unto you. And Lord, just be with us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. We have one more song to close with. So turn, it o turn over to number 24 in your books. Number 24, And Can It Be? It is uh, the title of the song is in the form of a question, really. And the verses go, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? You know, what, why am I so divert, deserving? Well, the truth of the matter is, we're not that deserving. But because God loved us, he sent Jesus to die for our sins. Let us sing uh, all three verses of this one. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain for me? service and of course we will be having our 11 o'clock service uh, Sunday morning so we look forward to seeing you then. God bless. <laughs>